This is objective 52, which is going to be cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and uh, cervical cancer. And the first uh, question is, what are four independent risk factors for cervical dysplasia? And the obvious answer is going to be HPV, and then people will usually put down uh, early intercourse, multiple partners, etc. But what you have to remember is that there are other risk factors, and we'll talk about HPV separately, but the other ones you have to watch out for are also smoking, because the carcinogens that show up in bronchial mucus also show up in cervical mucus, immunosuppression, and that's obviously things like HIV, and remember that cervical cancer and HIV is one of the AIDS defining criteria mm -hmm. now. And this sounds redundant, but to have cervical cancer, you have to have a cervix. And the reason for that is that you have to have a transformation zone. For HPV, remember that the differentiation is high risk and low risk. The low risk types, which are the cause of warts, are 6 and 11. And the high risk types are 16 and 18, most important, and then the ones in the 30s. And if they ask you about how it works, HPV makes E6 and E7. E6 will bind with P53 and turn it off. E7 will bind with the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor and turn it off. And then you have uncontrolled growth. Remember the transformation zone is normal. And this goes along with the, the idea of having the two-hit theory for any kind of cancer. Uh, a normal tissue that undergoes metaplasia is more likely to become malignant. And a perfect example of that is Barrett's esophagus, where your squamous metaplasia becomes uh, glandular, and this is a higher risk for esophageal cancer. Here is a normal transformation zone. Uh, not sure how likely it is they could ever show this, but if you look at it, this is not a great picture, but if you look at the detail, you can see the gland openings out here. And once you see the gland openings, then you know you're in the transformation zone. When you see the junction here, that's the inner squamo, squamo columnar junction. Out here somewhere is the outer junction, which is much less important. And then inside here is the endocervix. Here's a patient that comes in with postcoital bleeding, and we know that postcoital bleeding is suggestive of cervical cancer. And you see this ragged looking cervix here, and you see these, what looks like just blood coming out, but actually a lot of this is actually atypical vessels. And here's this abnormal looking tissue which has entirely replaced the cervix, and this is all full blown cancer. For pap smears, remember that they are going to trick you and try and get you to treat a patient based on the pap smear. That's like doing a radical mastectomy based on a mammogram. This is a screening tool. You don't make a diagnosis. Pap smears are an indication for a biopsy or a conization, but not for actual treatment. The current start age is 21. This has been dropped. Three years of sexual activity is not a reason to start someone before 21. Don't fall for that. The yearly exams are also being replaced by exams every two years until you're 30. So now we say you start at 21 and go every two years until you're 30. At age 30, you have a couple of choices. This is the one that has been popular for several years. You get a PAP and an HPV. If they're both negative, you can come back in three years. If your HPV is positive, you do the same thing in a year. And if your HPV is still positive, then you start doing colposcopy as long as the patient is HPV positive. And the reason for this is that uh, if you're HPV positive over the age of 30, you have about a 10% chance of developing severe dysplasia. Another way of doing this that has been put out about a year ago, so it's probably not going to be on a shelf anytime soon, is that... Uh, you can just go ahead and start doing pap smears every three years and ignore the HPV. And that's from the American College of ob -GYN. Now, pap smear systems, unfortunately, are kind of uh, mixed up. This is the World Health Organization system. A pap smear was either negative, atypical, or dysplastic, or cancer. Negative just meant normal. 
A typical could be either due to infection or HPV. Dysplasia, remember, means that the cells are immature, and it could be mild, moderate, severe, or it could be frankly malignant. So to get the government involved and muck things up, we now have the Bethesda system, and they first said that a pap smear not only has to be negative, but it has to be satisfactory. The original definition of unsatisfactory, which you may run into again, is transformation zone cells or endocervical cells. Currently, satisfactory means a cell count that is done by the computer. So if you see an unsatisfactory pap smear on your shelf, that means that there are not enough cells and you need to repeat the pap smear immediately. Then what they did was they said, okay, a pap smear can be either low grade or high grade. Low grade SIL means squamous intraepithelial lesion and that replaces CIN. And they said low grade can be either HPV or mild dysplasia. High grade can be moderate or severe dysplasia and cancer is still cancer. And one question that may show up on the shelf is they'll give you a list of pap smears and say which of these is consistent with low grade or high grade. And you have to match low grade to these two and high grade to these two. And again, this is kind of tricky, but a pap smear can be unsatisfactory and positive or satisfactory and positive. It doesn't matter. Now, to make it more confusing, there are some pap smears that just don't fit. So this is atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. And the way to remember it is we don't know what it is, so don't ask us. Most ask us pap smears are either normal or low grade. Very few are cancer, and somewhere around, somewhere around 15%, if it's confirmed, are high grade. The chance of being cancer is probably less than 1,000. Unfortunately, they also had a category called agus, atypical glandular cells of undetermined significance, and it turned out that this is a bad category. A lot of these are high grade, and a few are cancer. And as you know, OBGYNs are not the brightest lamps in the street, so we got ASCUS and AGUS mixed up, and patients died. So they turned around and said, oops, we're going to call AGUS AGC. So if you see AGC on the shelf exam or the boards, that is at least as bad as a high-grade PAP and maybe worse. And we'll come back to how to manage it. This is a histologic um, example of what dysplasia looks like. Normally on the bottom you have your basal cells and those are supposed to look abnormal. And then as you mature the cells become flattened and they eventually lose their nuclei on the top. When you have low grade which is mild, moderate, or severe changes the immature cells take up more and more until their full thickness and then finally with invasive cancer you turn around and you invade the basement membrane. So typically CIN or mild dysplasia, CIN1 is one-third, CIN2 is two-thirds, and CIN3 is complete replacement. And again, invasion means you have to go through the basement membrane. The next thing is how you manage pap smears. So the first question is, you're given a patient that has an ASCUS pap smear. Remember, those are usually normal or low grade. Give three choices for your management. So this is one thing you do need to memorize. If you have an ASCUS pap smear, you can do three things. You can repeat the pap smear twice. You can do high-risk HPV testing. Remember, if they tell you that it shows up being low risk, that means it's not a problem and you wouldn't do anything. Or you can send the patient right to colposcopy. Now remember that they do talk about cost on the shelf and the boards. So keep in mind that this costs 10 times as much as either this or this. So the answers they want are either this or this. And since HPV is very popular right now, this would be the one I was, would expect them to hit you with. If you're HPV positive, then you get sent to colposcopy. Now for the rest of these, if someone has a satisfactory and negative pap smear, you repeat it either in one year or two years if you're between 20 and 30, or three years if you have 
no history and you're over 30. If you have a past history, you would do it in a year. And again, that's something that they probably will not get in too much detail about because those are optional choices. Remember, unsatisfactory should be repeated right away because you didn't really do it. Ask us, we talked about three choices, and then everybody else gets colposcopy. Low grade, high grade, and AGC. Remember the AGC, since it's abnormal gland cells, could actually be endometrial cancer. So you also do an endometrial biopsy. Now, <clears throat> the next question is, what do you do after your colposcopy? This is something that they don't typically ask a lot about, and I would be surprised if they did. And in case you haven't noticed, the residents don't really know it either. So the idea here is that if your pap smear was low grade and your biopsy was negative or low grade, you watch them. And don't worry about the details, but you do the same thing. You can get two pap smears or an HPV. However, anytime you see a biopsy that is high grade, which means moderate or severe dysplasia, if the biopsy is high grade, you're going to treat the patient. And treatment can either be ablation or conization. Probably everybody who has rotated around Wayne State is just seeing conization done, which is usually a leap or a cold knife cone or a laser cone. Now, if your colposcopy, I'm sorry, if your pap smear was a high-grade pap and you're doing colposcopy, the options get a little more confusing. But the idea here is if somebody has a high-grade pap, you are less likely to watch them. And again, this is probably not stuff we have to worry about, but you are either going to go ahead and do conization, and the conization can be a leap or a cold knife cone, or you're going to watch them very carefully and bring them back several times. Microinvasion refers to one or two millimeters, up to three millimeters of invasion, and that is treated with conization, especially by a cold knife cone. That is beyond what I think they should ever ask you. And remember that if your colposcopy biopsies show actual invasion, you need to treat them as if they have cervical cancer because they do, and we'll come back to that. So a 55-year-old menopausal female has a pap smear showing AGC. You know that with AGC you are going to do colposcopy, and also because AGC might be endometrial cancer, we're going to do an endometrial biopsy. And if you look at all of these, none of these come close except for this one. Okay, cervical cancer. This is something that is the end stage for severe dysplasia once you've gone into the basement membrane. And the risk factors are the same except that the most common cause for getting cervical cancer is not having had a pap smear at all or not having had a pap smear in the past five years. In addition, the way that cervical cancer presents may be with bleeding or advanced symptoms. And really, there's three classical presentations. One is no symptoms, which means you picked it up by a pap smear or colposcopy. The next is postcoital bleeding. Now, the most common cause of postcoital bleeding is going to be cervicitis. But what you worry about is that it may be cervical cancer. And then if somebody has advanced cervical cancer, which means it's filled the pelvis, it's pushing against the pelvic sidewall, you can have what's called the terrible triad, which means lymphedema, sciatica, and hydronephrosis. So your lymph flow is blocked, you're pushing on the sciatic nerve, and you're pushing on the ureter. So a patient who walks into the shelf exam with postcoital bleeding, a swollen leg, and sciatic pain, you know they have advanced cervical cancer. Now, how do you treat cervical cancer? The most common treatment <clears throat> used worldwide is radiation therapy. And in the U.S. and Europe, we also add chemotherapy to make it more radiosensitive. If you have early stage cervical cancer, you can do a radical hysterectomy. You don't have to remove the ovaries. And since this is a carcinoma, which is spread lymphatically, we also do a lymph node dissection. You can still do radiation therapy at any stage when you have invasion. The preferred treatment 
For early stage cancer, however, is going to be a rad hist because there's fewer complications. If somebody has recurrent disease, in the majority of cases, these can't be cured. They can be treated, but they can't be cured. The exception is if somebody presents with a central recurrence, that would be initially treated with radiation, and then if that failed, you would do a pelvic exoneration, and if you've had surgery, that's uh, our version of an AP resection with a little more thrown in. So essentially, you remove all the pelvic organs. So this is something I do not want you to, to focus on, but very briefly, when you talk about radical surgery in GYN, we typically do radical surgery with cervical cancer and vulvar cancer. The remainder of the cancers, endometrial, ovarian, and tubal, are treated with a simple hysterectomy, which is a total abdominal hysterectomy, and also debulking surgery. Vaginal cancer is almost treated, is treated almost always with radiation therapy. But the radical surgeries you're going to see on our boards are cervix and vulva primarily. Remember these are carcinomas, so they spread lymphatically. So we do pelvic lymph node dissections for many of them. And then in vulvar cancer, we do groin node dissections. This is William Halstead. Uh, he uh, was the inventor of the radical mastectomy, and he also had a few extra problems on the top. We'll skip those tonight. Here's a pelvic exoneration specimen. Here's the vulva. Here's the uterus, the bladder. Here's the rectum. And if you look here on the anterior wall of the vagina, going up into the bladder is a large tumor and extending down here. And this has hopefully been completely resected. And it wouldn't have been done if there was any sign of spread. And the cure rate, if it is completely resected, is about 50%. And that is it for this.